is it? Or a meltdown? And how can I help? That's what we're going to explore in today's episode of Pookie Ponders. So let's dive straight in. I'm not going to lie. This is something I found hard, really hard as a parent. I didn't even know there was a difference between a tantrum and a meltdown when my girls were little. And that lack of understanding added that to the mix of two autistic daughters, one autistic mother, none yet diagnosed, and boy, did I get a lot of stuff wrong. So today's episode of Pookie Ponders is one I wish I could travel back in time and make Pookie Past listen to. Failing that, I hope that it helps you to unravel, understand, and respond a little bit better than I did to the big responses we see from our children from time to time. But remember, you will get it wrong sometimes and that's okay. Okay, so let's get started. So this is a topic that often gets tangled in misconceptions, the terms tantrum and meltdown. It's not uncommon to hear the word meltdown just kind of thrown around without a clear understanding of its truer meaning. So we're going to start by untangling the terms tantrum, meltdown and shedding a little bit of light on the common misuse of the word meltdown. So to start, what do we actually mean when we talk about a tantrum? So a tantrum is behavior with a purpose, behavior with a purpose. It's when a child is seeking to achieve a specific goal. It could be anything from wanting an extra biscuit to protesting about bedtime. It's, it's basically a, a method of communication, albeit quite a loud one often. Now, on the flip side, the term meltdown, and, and this is where things get interesting, um, contrary to popular belief, meltdown isn't just a kind of louder, bigger, more intense version of a tantrum. A meltdown is the result of sensory or information overload. It's, it's overwhelm in action, basically. It's when the, the brain, especially for neurodivergent individuals, but, but not exclusively, is, is pushed to its limits by too much inputs. It's overloaded. Um, that might be from the environment, from sounds, lights, or excessive verbal information. There's many things that could cause it, but it, it's, it's, it's in overload. Um, and, and this is, is where the, the confusion sets in. So the term meltdown is often misused. It's thrown around casually to describe any kind of intense disruptive behaviour. You might hear someone say in the supermarket, oh, my child's having a meltdown, when in reality, it might be a challenging tantrum. It, it might be a meltdown, but the two are really different and we're, we're going to learn about that. So this misuse, is, it's, it's important because it's more than just a linguistic hiccup. The way we respond to a tantrum versus a meltdown is also completely different and, and we'll learn more about that as the episode goes through. And it's, it's really important that we apply the right approach in order to be able to effectively support the child, both in order to prevent and to manage tantrum and meltdown. So like that's the really basic kind of difference. The, the tantrum has a purpose. It's a form of communication. The meltdown is basically my brain is overloaded. I am overwhelmed. It's all gone a bit broken. Um, they're really different. But let's let's unpick that ap apart a, li a little bit um, and explore a bit deeper. So a tantrum, I've said it's got a purpose. So what is the, the purpose of a tantrum? So tantrums, they're often seen just as this sort of challenging aspect of childhood, but they, they do serve a purpose. They're there for a reason. They, they happen not with out cause. It's a child's way of communicating a specific goal. And remember, for our little people or bigger people who have not got means of communicating in other ways, so some of our special needs children, for example, this might be the most effective form of communication that they have. Like reinforcement may show them that people hear me when this happens. That doesn't mean that this is a calculated thing on the part of the child, but something sort of subconsciously that they register as this works. So picture this, right? A, a, a child wants a shiny new toy or, or maybe they're resisting bedtime. That's a favorite one because well, who wouldn't want to stay up a little bit longer? They love you. They want to spend time with you. They've been doing fun stuff. And now you're telling them they've got to go to bed. Bed's boring. The key here is that the tantrum, that the, the child is in control and there's a purpose behind their actions. They want the toy. They want to keep spending time with you. On the other hand, the meltdown, it's not like that. So unlike tantrums, meltdowns are not about achieving a goal, staying up later, getting the toy. They're just a result of sensory or information overload. So a child in a busy shopping centre, there's bright lights, there's loud noises, there's an overwhelming crowd. 
I actually feel internal anxiety just talking about that. I, I really hate shopping centres. This isn't just a child thing. I might control often my kind of meltdown moments better than the typical small child. Um, but actually, a lot of this is about avoidance for me. But, you know, as a small child, you may be taken to the shopping centre. There's all that overload, the noises, the lights, the, the people, all the stuff. This is a lot, this influx of stimuli, it, it, it's going to push our brains beyond capacity and just potentially lead to this big, loud meltdown. So to understand the meltdowns a little bit better, let's just dive briefly into this concept of sensory processing that I've alluded to. And I know some of you know hugely about this, but, but some people come here for the first time and that's OK, too. We're all learning together. So for neurodivergent individuals, those who are not neurotypical, so we're thinking about our um, autistic, ADHD, dyslexic, dyspraxic, etc. There's a huge umbrella here. But for our neurodivergent individuals, particularly thinking here about our autistic or ADHD kids, the, the sensory system can function quite differently than for their neurotypical peers. So we, we process all the stuff around us a little bit differently than neurotypicals may. So everyday stimuli like lights, sounds, textures may be processed in a way that overwhelms the brain. This sensory overload can be a significant contributing factor to meltdowns. So imagine if you were in a room with flickering fluorescent lights and echoing noises and a variety of really strong smells. For some neurodivergent individuals, this experience is akin to standing in the midst of a sensory storm. It's just too much. This heightened sensitivity doesn't mean they're being difficult. It means their brains are processing so much information and they require understanding and support. Crucial here, meltdowns are not intentional acts of defiance. This is not a child being defiant. This is not a child with a purpose. This is a child who in this moment right now is feeling a little bit broken. It's a coping mechanism for the brain when the sensory world becomes too much to handle. It's like the ejector seat on a fighter plane, right? At this point, it's just got too much. It's not safe anymore. I'm out of here. Understanding this connection between sensory processing and meltdowns is really, really crucial, especially when we're supporting neurodivergent children. It allows us to approach meltdowns with empathy and to tailor environments to be a bit more sensory friendly as well, which helps to prevent those overwhelming experiences and the meltdowns in the first place. So as a parent, as a carer, as an adult working with children, how do you differentiate between a tantrum and a meltdown, especially considering sensory overload? So let's have a look at some of the observable behaviours. What can you see? Because they may, from the outside, look kind of similar. So during a tantrum, the child is somewhat purposeful. In the midst of a tantrum, the child might strategically ensure that you're watching the performance. Have I got your eyes on me here? Um, so the classic scenario in a shop, your child spots a coveted toy and suddenly the world all revolves around the shiny object. They might have engaged in conversation, trying to wheedle and negotiate the toy. And when that doesn't work, then we see this escalate into the tantrum type behavior. The, the, the key thing here is that there is a purpose, there is a specific goal. Interestingly, Sometimes they can be distracted by a new activity or another thing. Um, there's a goal they're trying to achieve here. They can be taken away from it. They might be trying to get your attention. There's a purpose. Contrast that with a meltdown. So in this state, the child is absolutely not trying to achieve a specific goal, certainly not one they could articulate. They might not be concerned if you're paying attention or not. Their focus is internal. They're, they're, it's going inward. They're battling with the overwhelming sensory or information overload. And this is the crucial distinction. No amount of distraction or bribery is going to calm them down. A different toy, an ice cream, is not going to stop the meltdown. But we know with tantrums, often it can. We buy the toy, we give them an ice cream, we distract them with something else. It can work. Meltdown, no, no. At this point, the brain is, is gone. We've gone a little bit kind of big and, and loud and scary and, and, and it's going to take time until we get to a point of calm. So the cognitive and emotional systems are temporarily overloaded. Their response is more visceral and instinctual.
So beyond these key differences, let's just dive a little bit more into things that you might be able to see just to give you a few more pointers here. So during a tantrum, a child might make eye contact, ensuring that you, you witness it. They might use words or gestures, so some form of communication to express their frustrations or their desires. So they're going to showcase some level of communication, potentially. They may also exhibit a certain level of control over their actions. Perhaps they're going to escalate or de-escalate based on the reactions that they receive from you. In contrast, during a meltdown, a child might withdraw from communication altogether. You might be getting nothing other than this wall of loud, perhaps. They might become non-verbal. They might find it challenging to express themselves in any form. Physically, you might observe other signs of distress. They might be covering their ears or their eyes to try and cope with sensory overload. And the other difference here is that meltdowns can be really prolonged. They might be 30 minutes or more reflecting those really, really intense struggles that are going on inside. So these nuanced behaviours that we've been talking about here, they offer a little bit of insight into the child's emotional and sensory state. And they allow the adults working with or caring for children to tailor our responses accordingly. Is it meltdown? Is it tantrum? How should I respond? We're going to think about this next as we explore some different communication strategies that we might use in a tantrum versus a meltdown. So taking tantrums first and remembering that a child's communication abilities are still somewhat intact during a tantrum. They might not be their very best eloquent selves, but they can still communicate with you. They might use words, gestures, or even employ some nonverbal reasoning in an attempt to convey their needs or frustrations. During a tantrum, the child can, to some extent, engage in conversation and respond to attempts to distraction. There's two-way communication going on here, albeit it might not be quite what you're used to in your day-to-day. Now, contrast this with a meltdown. In this heightened sense of emotional and sensory overload, communication abilities are going to diminish significantly. They may be almost none. The child may become non-verbal. They're going to find it challenging to express themselves using traditional language. This shift in communication dynamics is crucial distinction between tantrums and meltdowns and how we respond to them. So why? Why does this difference matter? It, it kind of forms the cornerstone of our ability to respond appropriately. So recognising that during a tantrum, the child can still engage in some form of communication. It allows us to employ certain strategies effectively. On the other hand, during the meltdown, when communication is compromised, our approach is going to need to adapt to meet the child's needs and capacity at this time. So we're talking to two very, very different children, even though it might be literally the same child at different times. So a key practice that's going to span both tantrums and meltdowns is the importance of active listening. So it's a fundamental skill that goes beyond just hearing words. It's going to involve truly understanding the emotions and the needs that the child is expressing. So active listening during both tantrums and meltdowns is going to involve acknowledging the child's feelings and digging deep and showing some empathy. It's not about condoning the behaviour, about, it's about recognising the emotions behind the behaviour. So it matters because active listening, really hearing what the child is saying, whether that is verbally, whether that is through nonverbal cues, whether that's through their behaviour or their demeanour and so on. Active listening is going to be a, a, a bridge to building trust. The child, when you are able to notice and observe and empathise, will feel more seen and heard. When a child feels heard and understood, it lays the groundwork for effective communication and support moving forwards. During a tantrum, active listening is going to help you to identify the underlying need or desire the child is expressing because they can have that two-way dialogue with you, allowing you to respond more appropriately. Okay, so great, Pookie, wonderful. But what does that actually mean for me as a parent or a teacher or other adult supporting a child? What can I actually do? Okay, let's explore. Let's do some practical ideas. It's, it's that time for me to do one of my slightly awkward lists. So just, just one thing before we do that, though, one sort of caveat to remember is that a child having a tantrum can communicate using the tools we put in place for a child having a meltdown, whose communication is compromised, whereas the opposite isn't true. So, so if we kind of work to the most challenging scenario, the meltdown, then those tools are going to benefit for everyone, whereas the tantrum tools are not going to work the other way around. So a child in true meltdown cannot level up 
and kind of access communication skills and practices that are available to a child mid tantrum. So if you're ever in doubt, if you're not sure what you're seeing, use strategies that cater to the needs of a child in meltdown because they are universal and accessible to all children. So as such, my five ideas I'm going to share kind of perhaps lean more towards meltdown friendly approaches. So first of all, Number one, there are five. Number one, visual communication tools. So the idea here is we create a visual communication board with pictures or symbols representing communication needs, allowing a child to point to what they need or want during a tantrum or a meltdown or as we begin to see this kind of brewing. This is going to foster a non-verbal form of communication. That form of communication we're able to access for a little bit longer than we can access verbal communication typically. So how would we implement this? We can have the board access in key locations like the classroom um, or somewhere at home that we're able to come whip it out when we need to or you can do kind of electronic versions as well that you might carry around on your phone and um, we need to teach the child how to use it during calm moments so they can apply it during challenging times and as we get more advanced with this we might help a child begin to recognize some of these internal cues that stuff is brewing for them and they might turn to using these sorts of communication strategies as their communication skills begin to diminish but before the meltdown or tantrum has been become fully fledged. Uh, number two, simple gesture codes. So the idea here, we, we develop a set of simple gestures or signs that a child can use to signal their emotional state. So for example, rubbing their temples might indicate stress, providing a non-verbal cue during meltdowns. Again, these non-verbal cues are really crucial here. So we do this by introducing the gestures during moments of calm, when the child has their thinking, problem solving, speaking brain online so we can communicate with them um, so we can establish a really clear communication of what these signs, these signals might mean. And then we can encourage the child to use these gestures when words may fail them. So number three is a calm down signal. So establishing a specific signal or phrase that signifies a designated calm down period. Um, so this can be especially helpful during meltdowns, offering a non-verbal agreement for a brief break from whatever it is that's overwhelming the situation, the what's going on. We can practice that calm down signal again during times of low stress, ensuring the child associates it with a safe and supportive space. This is essentially a way of agreeing ahead of time that a timeout is possible. This is how I will signal it to you. Maybe it's an actual kind of card or, or something like that, or maybe it's a, a visual signal that we do with our hands, but just agreeing something between you uh, and the child that says, I need a timeout. Things are beginning to feel quite difficult for me right now. And then knowing where we'll go, what that might look like. This is something that happens quite a lot in schools um, where a child might have a time out card in order to uh, relieve themselves from being in a classroom that might feel overwhelming if things begin to feel challenging. So it's kind of a version of that sort of a thing. Number four, patience and observation. So practice patience and observation. Allow the child time to express themselves in their preferred way, whether that's through words or gestures or non-verbal cues. So this is a, a thing for, for more of the time, just beginning to build our empathy and understanding of this child, beginning to understand all their different modes of communication all the time so that we can better help them in those times of high distress. So this is going to be about observing their unique communication patterns during the calmer moments as well. And this insight is then going to guide our responses during those more challenging episodes. So this is something we're going to, we're going to kind of emphasize for children who have these moments, who we want to be able to support better, supporting them, understanding, making them feel seen and heard and helping us to begin to speak their language during times of relative calm is going to mean we're better able to tune into what it is that they're trying to communicate or what it is that's challenging them in times of higher distress. And finally, good old social stories. So developing social stories that illustrate appropriate communication strategies during either tantrums or meltdowns. So using visuals and narratives to reinforce the concepts. So what does that look like in practice? We're going to share these stories again during calm periods. Lots of this learning happens outside the tantrum or the meltdown in order to prepare us for those challenging moments. We're going to use this to familiarize the child with effective communication techniques. We can refer back to them using simple language or visuals that might be 
needed during the more challenging moments. So at the times of calm, use the social stories to explore, be curious, never to judge, um, but to wonder with the child how we might be able to best support, what are the things that they can do to help us, to help them um, in those more challenging times. So these practical ideas, they're, they're aimed to bridge the gap in communication during tantrums and meltdowns. And by incorporating these sorts of strategies, we as adults can create supportive environments that cater to the unique needs of each child. Next, we're going to go on to explore the role of distraction and engagement during tantrums in particular. So distraction is a really powerful tool in the parenting arsenal, especially during tantrums. When a child is in the midst of a tantrum, not a meltdown, but in a tantrum, redirecting their attention to a different activity or object can often very quickly de-escalate the situation. So imagine a child's upset because they can't have that shiny toy. Introducing a new exciting activity can shift their focus and diffuse the tension. Or what we refer to in my house as squirrel, which is from, I think, up where the dog can talk and um, every now and then just in the middle of a normal conversation he suddenly sees a squirrel and goes squirrel which is something that all of my family do all the time but we can do this purposefully um, as in we do it all the time mimicking the dog from up but also we just can't help it we see a shiny thing we see something that interests us in our family just we interrupt normal conversations about other things with something that became pressing and more interesting right now. I think we all operate a little bit like small children, but sometimes this sparks wonderful conversations and we acknowledge this when it happens because it happens kind of without necessarily meaning to sometimes. We just get excited when we see something. Um, then everyone tends to go, squirrel! <laughs> anyway, that's a little insight into the madness that is my household. We can do this purposefully during a tantrum. So the child is focused, fixated, communicating in the way they have found to be affected through the tantrum that they want the toy. We can do squirrel and distract them with a different activity. Maybe we're going to blow bubbles or show them something else that's exciting or shiny or otherwise just basically try and draw them away from this, this toy they've got fixated on. However, crucial to recognise that what works during the tantrum isn't going to be effective during the meltdown. Distractions are going to fall flat when the child is in a state of sensory or information overload. The overwhelmed brain during a meltdown isn't going to easily shift focus and attempting to distract can sometimes exacerbate the situation. So during a meltdown, rather than distracting and trying to re-engage the child, the safety of the child is going to take precedence. They're not really in control of what's going on for themselves. So unlike tantrums where distractions can be employed more liberally, meltdowns are going to require quite a different approach. So attempts to distract are not going to just prove futile. They might actually escalate the intensity of a meltdown. It provides more incoming information. So the first priority is ensuring the safety of the child and of those around them. Okay, so with this in mind, I'm going to share some more practical ideas with you. Firstly, for distraction and engagement during tantrums, and then a few ideas for ensuring safety during meltdown. So really, really different approaches here. You're not going to get it right all the time. That's okay. You're going to misread the signs and you're going to head down the wrong path thinking that you know what you're seeing. You think it's a tantrum, but it's a meltdown or vice versa. That's okay. Be curious and be prepared to change track if you need to. It does get easier, though never easy, with practice. So just before we dive into those ideas, the practical ideas, we're just going to briefly touch on the concept of self-regulation. Potentially a topic for a whole other podcast, should you want it, let me know. Self-regulation, it's a vital skill that children will develop over time. It helps them to manage their emotions and their reactions on their own without always needing the support of an adult. Certain distraction techniques are not only going to provide this like immediate relief and distraction during the tantrum or meltdown, but could also help to contribute to the child's long term self-regulation abilities. So you, when you do this stuff that we're going to talk about, you're not just helping in this moment you're actually building skills um, that are going to make not just this moment but but all moments future moments more manageable for the child you're building those skills so it's a win right so practical ideas for distraction and engagement during tantrums so first of all preferred diversion objects so identify objects or activities that really specifically capture this child's attention and bring them comfort introduce these during a tantrum to redirect focus so you're going to keep a small collection of preferred items accessible and use them strategically during tantrums to shift the child's attention positively so what does this look like in practice so for example you may identify that the child finds comfort and joy in a specific 
stuffed animal and a, and a miniature puzzle. These objects are not only going to capture their attention, but they provide a sense of familiarity and security because they're known to them. So you get ultra organized and you keep a small bag or container with these items easily accessible, perhaps in your bag or within reach in the classroom. Now, when a tantrum starts brewing, you're going to calmly whip out the bag and present the stuffed animal and the puzzle. The child, already familiar with these items, are likely, very likely to shift their focus. The tactile engagement with the stuffed animal and the cognitive challenge of the puzzle are going to provide really positive redirection, easing the tension of the tantrum. Not every time, but often. Okay, next, calming sensory tools. So the idea here is introducing sensory tools, things like stress balls, fidget spinners, textured fabric um, during tantrums to provide a calming sensory experience. So you would explore various sensory tools during calm periods to understand the child's preferences because all children like different things and then have them to hand when they're needed. Okay, so let's imagine through observation and communication at times of relative calm, you've discovered um, that the child that you're working with um, seeks comfort in tactile sensations and in particular they really enjoy the feeling of squishing this particular stress ball. So during outings or events where the environment might uh, trigger a tantrum, we see it brewing, just making sure that that stress ball is readily available. When you notice the early signs of distress, offering the stress ball to the child and this offers a kind of tactile sensory distraction um, and the feeling of actually squeezing the ball can be comforting and a bit of an outlet for sensory and stress type feelings which can help to mitigate the impact of the tantrum. Next idea is interactive games. So engaging the child in simple interactive games that require focus um, can be particularly effective during more mild tantrums. So keeping a repertoire of games to mind that the child enjoys and can be easily initiated in challenging moments. So for example, consider a scenario where a child often experiences tantrums when faced with an unexpected change in routine. They don't want to do things differently and they're communicating that in the best way they know how. You discover this child has a keen interest in a simple matching card game. You found this at a time of calm. The game not only captivates their attention, but it also encourages focus and cognitive engagement. So distraction, essentially. You'd make this work by um, creating or sourcing a small set of these matching cards with images that resonate with the child. So if you can tailor it to them, even better, but we don't all have endless time. Um, not everyone owns a laminator. Many of us do. Um, but perhaps, you know, you might have them with familiar objects or, or, or source some that, that particularly speak to them. Um, something they, they enjoy that, that's likely, more likely to get their attention. So keep this game in your toolkit for those challenging moments. When you sense that the child is is got a bit of a mild tantrum brewing, you can um, introduce the matching card game. So the child's already familiar with the rules, they're likely to shift their attention to the game, channeling their energy into a more positive and enjoyable activity. So the act of matching cards becomes a soothing and engaging diversion helping to ease the tension of the tantrum so in particular here in my family this game would be double um, double is a, a matching game that comes in a small travel friendly tin which is great and you can get various versions of double um, so you can get versions that might particularly appeal to a child like um, I believe you can get things like Harry Potter versions and things like that so so double for us works if you want to buy something um, that's one that we found to be good in our home Okay, and then ideas for ensuring safety during meltdowns. So safe, quiet space. We, if we can designate a safe, quiet space where the child can retreat to reset during the meltdowns, that's going to in, in provide a secure and safe environment for those really intense moments when things might get quite out of control. It's not completely unheard of for children to hurt themselves or others completely accidentally in these moments when we kind of lose control of our brain, of our body, of everything that's going on for us. So establish and communicate the purpose of the space during calm times and then encourage the child to use it. Lead them there if you need to during those periods when they feel overwhelmed. So an example, a worked example here. Imagine a child in a school setting who often experiences meltdowns when overwhelmed by sensory stimuli. Recognizing the need for a space, you might designate a little cozy corner in the classroom with soft cushions and dim lighting. Sounds lovely. I want to go there a little bit now. You make this work by during the calm periods, explaining the purpose of the designated space to the child, emphasizing that it's a retreat for times when they feel overwhelmed or beginning to feel that way and they need a break. Encourage the child to personalize 
personalise the space with favourite blankets, stuffed animal, whatever feels good, comforting, um, source of calm for them. And encourage the child um, to use the space when the meltdown is imminent by gently guiding them to that safe haven and allowing them the quiet, secure, safe space to try and get back to that point of balance and calm. Next is consistent comfort items. Um, so providing consistent comfort items that the child associates with safety um, can offer kind of familiarity during meltdowns. So um, these items, familiar items, so we sometimes refer to things like transitional objects that the child might feel safer when they have them with them. They're going to bring a sense of security. Um, and we just want to make sure that these items are really easily accessible at times when we might need them. So for example, uh, picture a child who finds comfort in a specific soft blanket, a blankie, during meltdowns. This item is going to provide a sense of security, uh, a sense of familiarity, and it's going to be like a, a soothing anchor. So we're going to make this work by exploring the use of blanket during calm periods, discussing its role as a source of comfort with the child. We can have these discussions with the child at times of calm. And then ensuring that the child has got easy access to it, whether that's in their classroom or at home or on outings, when a meltdown occurs. And, and, and the blanket then becomes this tangible way to provide reassurance and emotional support. The great thing about the blanket it is a transitional object. It can move between places and people. For some children, a person can offer this kind of support. And that's amazing, that, that ability to co-regulate. But we can't always take that person with us everywhere. But the blanket, we can take the blanket. Um, and then the, the, the kind of final idea here in terms of keeping our children kind of safe and secure um, during meltdowns is, is calm reassurance. So offering calm reassurance during our meltdowns without overwhelming the child. So using a soothing tone and really simple phrases, remembering that their ability to uh, communicate both directions is going to be quite impaired here. So practicing gentle reassurance during calm periods is going to establish trust um, using a soothing tone and working out what phrases work particularly well for the child. We can then use those in the meltdown moments. So make it work by practicing using um, soft and soothing tone during moments of calm interaction, establishing a verbal cue such as saying, you're safe, I'm here for you during non-stressful times. Explore this, practice it. You practice saying it. What works for you? Does it sound good to the child? Does it make them feel safe? And then when a meltdown occurs, you're going to employ this calm reassurance. You're going to use these words the child has heard before, using a tone that the child has heard before, and it's going to feel safe. It's going to feel familiar. It's going to help them to calm. This consistent, gentle approach is going to help aid that feeling of security, that feeling of safety, that feeling of being understood during these intense emotional moments and allow the brain to begin to start to, to return to the point of calm. Whew. Okay, so there you have it. We have done a bit of a dive into the world of tantrums and meltdowns. Hopefully you're feeling that you have a bit more of an understanding of the difference between the two and some ideas for how to engage with each of those types of behaviour, having perhaps sometimes successfully recognised the difference between the two. I, I really hope so. And as I say, I wish I could travel back in time and explain this to Pookie Past because she really didn't get it and she often got it really, really wrong. So I would love to know. Did this actually help? Did it shed any light for you? I remember when I first learned about this having an aha moment and that deep sense of regret that I couldn't go back in time. I cannot, but I can help you now. And you cannot travel back in time, but you can think about how to adjust your behaviour and your responses and your understanding moving forward. So do that and hopefully find that it helps a little bit. Today has been all about untangling misconceptions, understanding the unique characteristics of tantrums and meltdowns and trying to equip ourselves with some practical strategies to navigate these challenging moments with empathy and effectiveness. I hope there were some helpful ideas in here for you. If you liked what you heard today, please subscribe, like and share my work. Uh, you can also support my work a little further should you wish to by joining me over on Patreon, where you get early access to all my resources and the chance to influence what I work on next. Or you can invite me to speak at your next event or in your setting, either virtually or face to face. Thank you so much for listening and for everything that you are doing for the children and young people in your care. This has been Pookie Ponders with me, Pookie Nightsmith. Until next time, stay curious, stay compassionate and keep pondering. Over and out.